All right, so it's good to see a large crowd here. Welcome to the Department of Nutritional Sciences Bodet Thompson Lectureship for 2023. Um, my name is Josh Miller, and I am a professor and chair of the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, I first want to just uh, read out a little bit of history about uh, uh, Drs. Bodet and Thompson. The, the lecture series is made possible with support from the families of Willard C. Thompson and Fred R. Baudet. In 1921, Dr. Willard C. Thompson was named professor and head of the poultry department at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, the forerunner of today's Department of Nutritional Sciences at, here at Rutgers. He was an outstanding teacher and researcher and regularly voted the most popular professor on campus. Thompson Hall on the Cook campus is named for him. Dr. Fred Baudet came to Rutgers in 1923 and worked closely with Dr. Thompson. He was the first veterinarian to be employed <clears throat> by the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Their development of vaccines to protect poultry from Newcastle disease and laryngotracheitis won worldwide acclaim. The Baudet Thompson Lectureship brings distinguished scientists to Rutgers University to lecture on cutting edge research in nutrition, science, and medicine. And now I would like to turn over the podium. Oh, for, uh, before I do that, we always sort of forget. Um, I want to first thank a few people. Um, uh, first of all, Christina Duffy, who's responsible for organizing all of this. Um, and then our Department of Nutritional Sciences Seminar Committee, uh, Harini Sampath, uh, who is chair for uh, setting this one up with uh, Malcolm Watford, Sue Shapsis, and Joe Dixon. All right. now. Let me introduce to you uh, Wendy Kohick, uh, the Dean for Research and Graduate Education here at SCBS, among other things. Uh, it's going to give you a welcome. Thanks to Josh um, for opening up our annual lecture. And I always love being here because I get to look out at all the faces of many friends and colleagues, students, associates and it's always an honor to be here. So I just want to say, add to Josh's comments that we really do thank the families for providing the funds for this endowed lectureship because what it does is give us the opportunity to know that every year we'll have the chance to have a really outstanding speaker in the broad area of nutrition and health come to speak to us. And so it's really a pleasure that today we have Dr. Samuel Klein from Washington University. And he's going to speak to us today. Dr. Shapsis will tell, give you more of a longer introduction. But he's going to speak to us today on, on what I find extremely critical and fascinating, uh, a critical and fascinating area of metabolic dysfunction. <coughs> and, and you know, I think we all have the question in society today with the obesity epidemic and um, the adverse metabolic consequences of that. Why is it that some people are obese, but they're perfectly healthy? So I think we really need to get at the pathways, the intermediary metabol um, metabolic pathways, to really tru truly understand that. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to put in a little bit of a plug for SEBS in that we are doing, um, I'm, I'm hopefully hoping that many of you in the room know this, but we are doing a cluster faculty hire in metabolic health. And that is between four departments at the school, <coughs> nutritional sciences, animal sciences, um, food science, and biochemistry and um, microbiology. Yeah, biochemistry and microbiology. And so I hope as you're thinking about Dr. Klein's comments, you also, and, and research, you also might think about what are we looking for in those candidates who we want to bring to campus? And, and how can we do impactful research to make inroads in this area here at Rutgers? And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sue Shapsis, who is going to introduce Dr. Klein. OK. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Sam Klein, who I've known for many, many years. Um, we haven't actually worked together, but his work is so interesting, and I read most of it, although I missed his 2022 article <laughs> that I started to read just before we came here, which is very important and interesting to me. 
Let me, let me be um, <coughs> formal and tell you that he's the William Danforth Professor of Medicine, Director of Human Nutrition and of Applied Research Sciences, and Chief of the Division of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm sorry, um, Division of, of Nutritional Sciences and Obesity Medicine. He directs the Weight Management Program in the Department of Medicine, and his hospital is rated top in the nation, and the medical school and residency program are top in the nation, and he mentors and trains many students um, who are excellent there. His education, he, he comes from uh, originally with, from Temple University. He's a Philadelphia boy, I heard um, yesterday, so he started out there. He has a master's in nutritional biochemistry and metabolism, so he did that along the way with his MD. He has a residency at Boston in Nutrition and Metabolism Clinical Fellowship at Harvard and followed by GI Fellowship at Mount Sinai in New York City. He's board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and in nutrition. He's the past president of many of our societies that we all know so well in the field. Certainly the Obesity Society, which used to be called North American Association for the Study of Obesity. It was a very complicated um, name, and so they changed it. Also, the American Society of Clinical Nutrition and the inaugural chair of the study section at NIH called IPOD that many of us know very well, Integrated Physiology, Obesity, and Diabetes. They may have changed names in recently. He has a lot of grant funding. He's been consistently funded by NIH since 1990, and he currently has five or more NIH grants and NIH reporter. Um, that's very, very impressive. Uh, he runs the Nutrition Obesity Research Center, one of a few around the country at Washington University. He has 450 published um, articles, numerous other awards and, and the, for his research that I can't mention because there's too many to list here. And being invited to the Botet Thompson Lectureship at Rutgers will add to the, award, the list of awards. <laughs> but I'd like to share one story of Dr. Klein um, with you, um, because he, he um, has a commitment overall, despite the circumstances. I heard Dr. Klein speak at a national meetings over the years, many of them, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and I saw him virtually at the time-restricted eating NIH lecture just two weeks ago. His work is fascinating. I'm not going to say much about it. He's going to talk about that. But what I remember is one packed uh, obesity society conference, and it was a huge room, and everybody was dressed up at the time. It was probably 15 years ago. And his flight was late, and he made it, but his luggage didn't make it. And he started his lecture with, please don't mind me lecturing in my pajamas. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Even though he was wearing his pajamas, he didn't put any of us to sleep. It was a great lecture. And I am going to end with that and tell you we're very fortunate to have Dr. Klein join us today as the Bodette Thompson speaker. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Sue. I have no memory of that <laughs> at, at all. <laughs> and I deny that that ever happened <laughs> as well. But it's really a pleasure to be here, an honor uh, to be uh, asked to present this lecture. Uh, this is really a great place. It's a unique place. The um, cross disciplines among nutrition, nutritional science, nutritional therapy is really unique here uh, from around the country and exercise science as well. Uh, too many sciences in this area to really uh, even talk about. Uh, so you have a really unique opportunity for training and, and uh, productivity here that's, that's different than many other places around the country. And so it's an honor to be here and to see old friends, some, some very old, like Malcolm Watford, uh, but <laughs> uh, here and interact, and interact with the people that I've met, uh, that I've interacted with today. It's really a, a great place. So with that, uh, I'll begin and just review this issue of the metabolic heterogeneity of obesity. That, you know, every disease has considerable heterogeneity in people. And so we put people into categories uh, and we try to group them into it, but there really is hard to group in many of these diseases. We have to understand that obesity really varies from person to person in terms of not just the amount of body fat that someone has, 
but actually how that excess body fat translates into metabolic and other diseases as well. And these are this. So it's important to understand then that nearly uh, probably every organ system in the body is adversely affected by having excess body fat. So obesity has adverse effects on every single organ system in the body. Uh, but the ones that are the most important are the ones here in this center column here that are the cardiometabolic complications because they're the most common and they have severe uh, adverse outcomes. And so things like having increased fat in your liver, uh, having increased triglyceride, low HDL cholesterol, atherogenic dyslipidemia, prediabetes and diabetes, uh, these are all risk factors for heart disease, heart failure, and stroke. And the underlying mechanism for these problems are related to resistance to the function of insulin in multiple organs, as well as dysfunction of the beta cell. And maybe now we should even think about abnormalities in sympathetic nervous system activity, as I learned this morning from uh, uh, Christoph uh, as well. <clears throat> but these are also here in orange, are also metabolic abnormalities that are associated with obesity, but haven't been quite recognized as, as such. But things like chronic kidney disease, cancer, related to growth factors potentially of being obese, osteoarthritis, and also dementia, cognitive dysfunction, where now, you know, uh, Alzheimer's is, is being called type 3, you know, uh, diabetes. And so these abnormalities are very, very important. And if we can understand the mechanisms of why someone who goes from being lean to being obese develop these abnormalities is very important. And why, when you lose weight, does everything get better? So we don't really understand why people develop these problems, and we don't really understand so well why it gets better with weight loss. And this has now put the understanding that being obese underlies so many diseases. And now with these newer therapies we have with GLP-1 agonists that really have profound effects on body weight, we really have an ability to have major um, impact on developing diseases and treating these diseases. But not all people who become obese, as was just mentioned, develop metabolic complications. And some people seem to be resistant to the adverse effects of excess body fat and considered to have metabolically healthy uh, obesity. So if we could understand why some people are healthy and some aren't, we could uh, develop targets, uh, we could develop, uh, identify pathways that could be targets for therapy. Now the problem with this whole field is that the definition of metabolically healthy obesity is very unclear. And there's been more than 30 different definitions published in the literature in different studies. And here, you can see, depending on how rigorous your definition of metabolic health is, will determine the prevalence of metabolically healthy obesity in the obese population. It also depends on which population you're studying. So if you're studying young women, you'll have a lot of metabolically healthy obese people. If you're studying older men, you'll have very few or no metabolically healthy obese uh, people in that population. But if you use one of the most common definitions in the literature, which is less than two, two or fewer metabolic syndrome criteria, and those criteria are related to body mass index, waist circumference, blood pressure, bl uh, blood lipids, and blood glucose. If you use that as your definition of metabolically healthy obesity, then 50% of people who are obese are metabolically healthy. But that definition would include people potentially with type 2 diabetes as being metabolically healthy if they have two or fewer metabolic syndrome criteria. And as you go down this um, figure here with people have low, uh, this home IR, homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance, is that's a measure of your insulin and glucose concentrations. You see that fewer people uh, are metabolically healthy. And if you get more and more stringent of having no metabolic syndrome criteria at all, and having a normal home IR, normal home IR, normal blood glucose, normal insulin concentrations, then only about 7% in this, these studies are metabolically healthy. And if you go even further by looking at insulin sensitivity measured by more uh, intensive measurements, it would be even fewer. So metabolically healthy obesity, real metabolically healthy obesity, is quite rare, but it exists, as I'll try to prove to you in a minute, and, and show you that studying them might be a very important uh, target uh, for identifying the pathways that cause metabolic harm. So here, this is just a uh, figure of 339 participants that we studied without type 2 diabetes with a range of body mass index, which you know is a crude measure of adiposity. Body mass index is your, 
is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So it's a relationship between your body, uh, body mass and your height. And looking at insulin sensitivity using a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp procedure. This is a procedure where you infuse insulin at a physiological rate, a postprandial, after you eat a meal type of uh, concentration. And you measure the rate at which you have to infuse glucose to maintain a normal blood sugar. So if you're very insulin sensitive, your muscles will actively take up glucose, and you'll require a high glucose infusion rate to maintain you glycemia. If you're insulin resistant, you require very little glucose infusion to maintain you glycemia. So this is a very precise measure of insulin sensitivity using this glucose infusion and insulin infusion challenge approach, challenge technique. And you can see here there's a range of, of insulin sensitivity measured as glucose infusion rate. And this is just expressed here as micromoles of glucose per kilogram fat-free mass per minute. There's different ways to express it, but this is one way uh, shown here, that there's a negative curvilinear relationship with body mass index and insulin sensitivity. The thinner you are, the more insulin sensitive you are, and the heavier you are, the higher the BMI, the more insulin resistant uh, you are. Uh, but there's considerable variability. There's a lot of heterogeneity. So if you have a body mass index of 35, which is considered class two or stage two obesity, you have a huge range in insulin sensitivity, where some people have the same glucose infusion rate as lean, healthy people, and some people are very insulin resistant. And so we're studying these people who are insulin sensitive here, the metabolically healthy obese, and these people are insulin resistant here to try and understand the differences between these two groups. Now you could say, well, maybe there really is no difference, but all you've done is You've gotten an obese person early in the scheme of things. And if you just wait long enough, these people here are going to become these people down here. They will move down the ladder as they age. And so that there is no such thing really as metabolically healthy obesity. You've just caught them earlier. And so I'm going to argue that there is such a thing as metabolically healthy obesity, because if there isn't, then my job is finished. <laughs> And retirement is around the, it's around the corner anyway, but it's really around the corner. <clears throat> and so we did this study a few years ago uh, where we took people with metabolically healthy obesity, and I'll define the criteria a little bit later on, and we took people with metabolically unhealthy obesity, not with type 2 diabetes, but the two extremes of metabolic function, and we had them increase their calorie intake by about 1,000 calories a day prepared by these metabolic kitchens uh, shown here. <laughs> and we then studied them before and after they gained about 6% of body weight. So compliance was not important. If they took longer to get there or shorter to get there, it didn't make a difference. We studied them before and after 6% weight loss, a moderate increase in body weight of those who are metabolically healthy obese and unhealthy obese. And these are calorie counts that were carefully recorded. But as you all know, calorie re food records are not the most reliable. So it didn't quite matter that much because we studied them before and after this amount of weight gain. But in general, the food records suggested that they were eating 1,000 calories extra a day uh, in both of these groups. And the composition of the calories were really identical in terms of the macronutrient composition, although the, the macronutrient content may have changed in terms of more sugar, sweetened beverages, et cetera, with the increase in carbohydrate intake. Oops. <clears throat> and so what we found was, and I won't go through all the details, a very interesting finding is that is the metabolically healthy obese people in white, shown here, metabolic unhealthy in white, shown here at baseline, um, in terms of their insulin sensitivity, which is the glucose disposal rate or glucose infusion rate, um, was much greater. The percent increase in glucose disposal rate in response to insulin infusion was much greater in the metabolically healthy obese than the metabolically unhealthy obese, as you can see here, is what you would expect. But after they gain 6% body weight, there is a marked decrease in insulin sensitivity in the unhealthy obese people, as shown here, which you would expect as well, but absolutely no change in the unhealthy, in the healthy obese population. And so the healthy obese people were resistant to the adverse effects of gaining 6% body weight, whereas the unhealthy obese were very sensitive to that, showing a distinct metabolic response to this moderate weight gain in these two groups. And then we have this unique case history to share with you as well that Sarah Farabi recently published, where we had a, we're following these metabolically healthy obese people longitudinally over time. 
And this is a woman that we followed for five years, where in 2016, she had a body mass index of 37.7 and a weight of 98 kilograms. But she gained a lot of weight in five years. She gained 32 kilograms, 32% of her body weight, so that now her body weight was about 50 kilograms. And, and I mean, BMI was 50, 50 uh, kgs per meter squared. And her weight was 128.4 kilograms. So she gained a huge amount of weight over this five-year period. But, and, she, and most of this weight gain was from body fat, as you can see here, the difference in kilograms and body fat. But in terms of her metabolic abnormalities, there was no change. Her fasting triglyceride concentration was not different. Her intrahepatic liver fat content increased, but still within the normal range, below 5%. Her fasting glucose concentration was unchanged. The glucose tolerance test, which is measure, uh, measuring glucose after drinking a sugar drink, uh, two hours later was not changed. And insulin sensitivity, measured as glucose infusion during the clamp procedure, if anything got better, was unchanged. So this shows you that some people are genetically predisposed to stay healthy. And we've all seen these people in our lives as well, and clinicians here in our practices. These tend to mostly be women with lower body fat distribution and not men with the pot belly, you know, abdominal fat distributions, which is much more typical of metabolically unhealthy obesity, but women with lower body fat distribution are the subset of people that tend to have metabolically healthy obesity. And so there's two theories, uh, two main theories, as to why increasing body fat causes metabolic harm. And I'm going to review these two theories with you uh, very briefly uh, here. And so one theory is this expandability hypothesis theory. And that is, is when you gain weight, your adipose tissue mass gets larger, but the way it gets larger can make a difference. And so if you gain weight by, prolif by causing increased differentiation and prolifer proliferation of fat cells, then you can gain weight in a healthy way because your fat cells still stay within a smaller size and they still have access to capillary diffusion and blood and nutrients, et cetera, and you can have a positive energy balance and be obese but be healthy. But if you gain weight where you don't proliferate these fat cells and they become larger, then you have unhealthy obesity. And somehow, these large fat cells do things and must secrete things that cause harm to other organs in the body. There's also a theory that the inability to, and then these, the, the capacity of these, of adipose tissue to store fat is then limited. It has a limited expandability. And so when these adipose tissue cells cannot get any larger, then the fats that would have been in those cells get redeposited in other organs, like the liver and muscle, and cause abnormalities in those tissues. Now this theory, on the face of it, seems illogical, because to think that the few percent of triglyceride from your whole body triglyceride that's deposited in liver and muscle causing potential harm could not be stored in your kilograms and kilograms of adipose tissue seems implausible. But this is one of the accepted dogmas at this moment as we speak. And hopefully none of these authors are listening uh, to this here. Then the other potential theory, major theory, is one that's been proposed by Phil Shear and others. And that is this theory that when you increase the size of your adipose tissue mass and you have inadequate capacity to, um, to provide blood flow, circulation to the adipose tissue, then that cause harm. So if you can increase the mass and have adequate capillarization, then you supply the nutrients and oxygen to keep those, that adipose tissue healthy. But if you don't, you develop hypoxia, and this hypoxia causes inflammation and fibrosis. And somehow this inflammation and fibrosis and adipose tissue sends signals out to other organs that cause metabolic harm uh, as well. So the way we do these studies, and I'm going to skip, in fact, Let's make this interactive where you can, because uh, there's a lot of, I see the future of our, of our science is in the room here, a lot of students here. So let's make it interactive. Stop me and ask a question uh, if you want. That excludes you, Malcolm. We're talking about the, uh, the young, uh, happy people uh, in the room <laughs> uh, here as well. So uh, feel free, let's make this a family-like uh, presentation. And so the way we decided to look at this is to take people at these extremes metabolically healthy obese MHO, metabolic unhealthy obese, and metabolically healthy lean, and doing a careful interrogation of their metabolic function. 
And the metabolic unhealthy obese, we excluded people with type 2 diabetes because that messes everything up. People with diabetes are at the end of the spectrum. They have medications that confound your interpretation of the data. And so we exclude people with uh, any kind of medications that are anti-diabetic or metabolic type of medicine. But you can see here the healthy obese, unhealthy obese are matched very carefully in BMI, percent body fat, obviously more than the healthy lean people uh, shown here. The unhealthy obese have uh, increased liver fat content way above the 5% normal cutoff, so they have fatty liver disease compared to the healthy obese, which is similar to healthy lean. They have increased fasting glucose concentrations. These two groups over here are the same. They've increased two-hour glucose tolerance tests, uh, glucose as well, compared to the normal range in the healthy obese and healthy lean. They have a much higher fasting insulin concentration, but the healthy obese also have a higher insulin than the healthy lean. So they're not completely insulin sensitive. They also have insulin, um, higher insulin concentrations, and they also, well, they also have higher triglyceride concentrations, a little bit than the healthy lean, but not statistically different, but much lower than the unhealthy obese shown here. And finally, their insulin sensitivity measured by this clamp procedure shows the differences between the three groups very resistant in the unhealthy obese, a very low infusion rate to maintain euglycemia, a higher infusion rate in the healthy obese, and an even higher infusion rate in the healthy lean. Expressed per kilogram fat-free mass. So not expressed per kilogram body weight, but per kilogram fat-free mass. Now, there is a difference here in the healthy obese insulin sensitivity versus a healthy lean. But we retrospectively then pick people in the healthy obese group and match them on insulin sensitive with a healthy lean group. I'm not gonna show that data here because it's a smaller number of subjects, uh, but there's no difference at all in our conclusions if you take only the healthy obese people that are matched completely on insulin sensitivity with the clamp procedure with the healthy lean people. So if these two are identical, there'll be no difference in the findings that you'll see uh, here. And let me just review then a few things and show you the differences between these groups in terms of metabolic health and metabolic function. If you measure plasma glucose concentrations all day long, uh, every hour, even more frequently after meals, during the day, give them a little break you know, uh, at night to encourage a sleeping, although these are measured by, by tubes that are attached to the participant and go through a portal in a wall so you can take blood samples without disturbing them at night. You see that in red, unhealthy obese have a much higher plasma glucose concentration then do the healthy lean in black and the healthy obese in blue, which are pretty much identical. And so 24 hours a day, people have unhealthy obesity are being bombarded with hyperglycemia. And these are now eating the same meals in this particular you know, study, although <clears throat> having different meals would, you know, could change this potentially. <clears throat> Plasma insulin concentrations are much higher in the unhealthy obese compared to the healthy obese and compared to the healthy lean, but the healthy obese have higher plasma insulin concentrations than the healthy lean people. And that includes people that are matched on insulin sensitivity. So people matched on insulin sensitivity who are obese, that I'll show you later, have hypersecretion of insulin, even though their insulin sensitivity is the same. And you can see the insulin secretion rate uh, modeled here is, is, again, stepwise down from unhealthy obese to healthy obese to healthy lean shown here, and also insulin clearance rate. The removal of insulin from plasma is decreased in unhealthy obese. So unhealthy obese people have higher circulating plasma insulin concentrations all day long because they, in, they secrete more insulin and they clear insulin less efficiently. And so these two circulating sub, yes, Tracy, question. Yeah, so these are, yeah, these are all pretty much the same age. It's about 45 to 50 range. These are yeah, middle-aged adults are here. The lean people are a little, actually a little bit younger. They're about 10 years younger because it was hard, to, but that change, difference in age is unlikely to have an influence. And when you correct for that, it doesn't make a change as well. It doesn't change any results. The obese people are very carefully matched on sex, age, um, what else? whatever, uh, and, and bo percent body fat and body mass index, the two groups. Any other questions? Yes? Me. 
Hold, hold on. We, we got to get it on the microphone. Yeah. Oh, am I ruining it by having them speak? <laughs> oh. um, what were the markers that... Talking to the magic box? <laughs> <laughs> what markers determined if an individual was healthy? Was it I, just I, the ones you guys um, were showing I didn't hear a thing of? you said. Say it again. <laughs> what markers determined if an individual was healthy? Oh, what marker determines if they're healthy? Yeah. Just those? So, good question. So, sorry, to, they would have to have normal liver fat content, normal fasting glucose concentration, normal two hour glucose tolerance test, normal triglyceride concentration, and a normal insulin sensitivity measured by the euglycemic clamp procedure. So, really rigorous, which has not been reported anywhere in any study. And it's, there's so few of these people, it's hard to study them uh, in big populations. All the studies that you are, to, are around today really have metabolically healthy obese people who are not really metabolically healthy obese at all. And one more question. Yes. Um, so other, why you have the box? Take advantage. Yeah. <laughs> other um, disorders or syndromes, such as like polycystic ovarian syndrome, yeah, was, so were those all, the, all ruled out? Yeah. So any diseases that have metabolic impact are are excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, any kind of and any medications that could affect metabolic function are excluded as well. Okay. So people even on beta blockers, you know, are excluded. But we did allow people, um, of course, in even in the unhealthy obese people. Polycystic ovarian syndrome was excluded, as well as being on steroid therapy, uh, as well as and, and having type two diabetes. Okay, thank you. These are essentially people with pre-diabetes, the metabolic and healthy group. Yes, but that's an active row back there. Yeah, you're um, next, the woman on the left. <laughs> uh, so I know that you mentioned that um, age didn't have a factor on your research, but um, did you ever look into if sex had a factor? or in terms of like your, um, like your race? Because I know sometimes like South Asians are more susceptible to having, um, yeah. yeah, you know, you get my gist of where I'm going. Yeah, so a age is a factor, except not in this study, it was only 10 years difference in the, in the lean and the obese people, and the obese were matched. But ethnic racial background is critical. And so, um, uh, and that's because if you're South Asian from India, East Asian, you know, China, and also Aborigine, you know, from uh, Australia, you have an a increased risk of the metabolic abnormalities of obesity, even though you might be lean by body mass index and even by percent body fat. And so why that's the case is, is not quite clear to me, but it's certainly an increase in insulin resistance uh, in people from um, South Asia, meaning India, and also, it looks like maybe a decrease in beta cell function in people from the Asian, East Asian countries. But that, uh, it, to me, is not quite clear. And that's a very heterogeneous as well, like everything else uh, is. But there, the reason why those people are genetically predisposed uh, to becoming insulin resistant and having beta cell dysfunction early is not quite understood. But if they change their lifestyle, and so you can see people you know, with a, a little bit of a pot belly that would be a normal Caucasian, it's a very abnormal South Asian uh, person in terms of metabolic health. And that's another group that we didn't study because we had trouble recruiting them, and that's the metabolically unhealthy lean, that people l metabolically are obese even though they're lean in terms of their uh, body weight. One more question. <laughs> yes. Um, so you said how the metabol metabolically healthy obese people, how you see slight increases. Um, over time, wouldn't those values increase as well, even if they're considered healthy? Yeah, so they're, in general, as you get older, you, get more, you have more organ system dysfunction. And so you, in general, your weight goes up until about the age of 60, 65, and then epidemiological trends suggest it goes, goes down. Um, but you have a, a decrease in kidney function, liver function, muscle insulin sensitivity. So everything should get worse as you get older. And obesity, you can look at as sort of premature aging. We have all the abnormalities of being old at a younger age. And so all the, all the ab metabolic abnormalities of being older are identical to the abnormalities of being obese. This woman who gained the weight over five years 
really didn't give her enough time to show the adverse effects of aging. But when she's 80, uh, if, if her joints hold up, uh, you know, she'll, I'm, I'm sure she'll be much worse off metabolically than she is now. So if you, there's been also this dogma that increased free fatty acids, which is now a breakdown product of triglyceride and adipose tissue that's released into the bloodstream, circulates in the bloodstream, and wreaks havoc on organs by being taken up by different organs and causing lipotoxicity in those organs. And that's based on uh, data that's showing if you give uh, experimentally increasing free fatty acid concentrations, really way above the physiological range that you see in normal people, you cause insulin resistance. And so if we look at these people, don't have diabetes, because people with diabetes are different, but the unhealthy obese compared with the healthy obese are not that much different. You can see that the healthy obese are the same as the lean in terms of free fatty acid concentrations, but the unhealthy obese have an increase in fatty acid concentrations of about 15% or so all day long, and at night it seems to go a little bit higher. This really does not support the hypothesis that fatty acids are an important mediator of metabolic dysfunction physiologically in people that have metabolically abnormal obesity. And, uh, but what you see a big difference, and that is by design, is triglycerides. This is triglycerides concentrations, unhealthy obese shown here, compared to the lean and healthy obese shown here, is markedly increased. Now triglycerides, as you know, circulate, and lipoprotein lipase will release free fatty acids from triglycerides into multiple organs. So it's possible that if there is lipotoxicity, it's due to triglyceride and not due to free fatty acids. Christoph. We don't have glycerol, but we did measure lipolytic activity at baseline uh, using tracers. And in our hands, we find basal lipolytic activity is no different in the healthy obese and unhealthy obese. Uh, using C13 pomatate tracer, yeah, not, not a glycerol tracer. Glycerol, glycerol tracer is not a great tracer because it's contaminated by VLDL triglyceride lipolysis as well. So pomatate really gives you a measure of adipose tissue uh, lipolysis. And so in our hands, we find it's not different. And remember, adipose tissue is very sensitive to insulin. Um, and so when people who have metabolic and healthy obesity eat a meal with higher insulin concentrations, even though they're insulin resistant, they have a rapid reduction in fatty acid concentrations, a, a measure of lipolysis, very similar, as you can see here, uh, to the um, uh, healthy obese people. But again, this depends on the diet they're consuming. So if someone's eating a ketogenic diet, it'll be a much higher you know, rate of lipolysis because insulin is very low. And if they're eating a sugar-sweetened beverage diet, then it'll be even lower. So you don't need a lot of insulin to nearly maximally suppress lipolytic activity. Any other older people with a question? Okay. I'm going to skip this. So if you measure then uh, lipogenic activity using a deuterated water tracer, and this is done with Mark Kellerstein, um, you can measure the incorporation of deuterium into the glycerol backbone of triglyceride and measure triglyceride synthesis rates in these subjects. And that's a measure then of the, of the functional activity of triglyceride synthesis in adipose tissue in these people to see if this inability to make triglycerides and keep them in adipose tissue is a problem. We've already, I've already mentioned that lipolysis is really, so both the healthy and unhealthy obese have the same amount of body fat. That means that their production of body fat and their breakdown of body fat must equal each other because they're at a stable, steady state. Now, it could be higher or lower in both groups, but they're maintaining the same amount of body fat. So it, their ability to store that amount of body fat is the same. And the synthetic capacity is no different. The triglyceride synthesis is higher in terms of grams per week in the obese people than the lean, but no difference between the two group, groups. And if you measure their fat cell size, which is the other part of that hypothesis, saying that people who are obese and unhealthy have larger fat cells, and these larger fat cells are unhealthy, releasing things that are bad into the bloodstream, you see here that the healthy obese in orange and unhealthy obese in gray if you look at their fat cell size on the x-axis, shown here in different buckets of fat cell size, 
in relationship to percentage of fat cells that are those size, you see that the obese people have more larger fat cells than lean people, and they have larger, peak larger fat cell size than lean people, but there's absolutely no difference between the two obese groups. So this, I think, really um, suggests that the expandability hypothesis is not true. Would you agree, Christoph? If he agrees, we're good. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. This is abdominal, subcutaneous abdominal adipose tissue, not femoral fat, uh, lower body or gluteal fat. So that there could be differences in other depots that we don't look at. But, and then we assume that <coughs> sub-Q abdominal fat is the same as arm fat, back fat, and uh, all that stuff, and that it's a major you know, source of body fat. But we don't know that for sure as well. I'm just going to zip through some things, give you some just general concepts then, and not go into too much uh, details. But if you measure oxygen tension adipose tissue, you use oxygen probes. So that's measuring interstitial oxygen, not, not, and not intradipocyte oxygen, which you can't measure, which is what you really need to measure. You do see this trend of a decreased oxygen tension in unhealthy obese from healthy lean down, an increase in HIF1-alpha, which is a protein that's made in response to hypoxia, and it's hypothesized HIF1-alpha is responsible for triggering inflammation and fibrosis in adipose tissue. So that's consistent in the, uh, in the humans compared to what you see in rodents. And if you measure collagen metabolism and look at gene expression of like 27 different collagens in human adipose tissue and combine them together, you see a, a progressive increase in collagen gene expression, a progressive increase in collagen synthesis rates, and also if you do histological analysis, you can see that collagen stain here is increased in the unhealthy obese compared to lean people. You see fat, bigger fat cells, as you know, and also increased fibrosis, increased collagen. The question is, so what? Having increased collagen doesn't mean anything or increased fibrosis unless it sends some signal to other organs causing the liver and muscle to be insulin resistant. And so that's been the missing link that we assume these associations are causation, but you can't assume that. You have to actually prove the cause and effect. And now recent data suggests that maybe endotrophin, which is a break breakdown project of collagen 6 and adipose tissue, could be one of those links. And so here I'm not going to go through the data, but uh, in, in rodents it's very clear that endotrophin is increased in obese animals where collagen 6, is the production of adipose tissue is increased. It's hydrolyzed by these metalloproteinases, and that produces endotrophin that goes into the bloodstream. And we find in our groups, endotrophin progressively increases as well. And somehow, this endotrophin magically causes insulin resistance and glucose intolerance in other organs. And actually, we've done some, or Phil Shearer, we've worked together with him doing incubation studies of myotubes and showing if you incubate myotubes with endotrophin, you actually cause insulin resistance in those myotubes. Um, and decrease insulin signaling, Christoph, as well. Um, uh, but, and you can see here the endotrophin is higher in metabolic and healthy obese, suggesting this is a potential mechanism. Again, these are all correlations. In humans, you can never really get to mechanisms. You need basic scientists to do the mechanistic work for the most part because we can only show correlations. We can't knock genes down in people. We can't, you know, overexpress genes. And we can't give toxic chemicals to you know, regulate a lot of these pathways. And when we do give drugs to regulate a, a metabolic pathway, they're often very dirty. They do more than just regulating that specific pathway that you can do in uh, rodent models in cell culture. But the two have to go together. And actually, this is now my pitch. Uh, there was a pitch earlier for the, the uh, cluster hire. But a pitch now, this is a very basic science-oriented you know, programs that you have here, is to encourage the translational clinical science here as well and uh, to get students more and more involved in doing clinical research um, with some of the faculty that are here. And that means investing in a clinical research unit uh, where overnight stays can be done. For $10 million, you can get a beautiful unit, uh, uh, Josh. <laughs> <coughs> and it'll be very well utilized on this, this campus. And I think we should uh, talk to the chancellor uh, about that. You're here. Now, the next dogma is really um, this dogma of adipose tissue inflammation 
being responsible for insulin resistance. Now, this is a dogma that's based on looking at in animal models for the, for the most part, showing that obese rodents have increased macrophages predominantly in adipose tissue and M1-like, the angry macrophages that are pro-inflammatory. And they also increase cytokines, inflammatory proteins circulating in the bloodstream as well that may be coming from adipose tissue. And the hypothesis is those cytokines, when I possibly been shown by some people, can cause insulin resistance in other organs. But is this really, now, a rodent is not the same as a person. They have a very hard life. You think your life is hard. Be a rodent out in the cold, running around, you know, so you have developed, and eating all kinds of, you know, junk. Uh, you, you have a very different, immune system, very different adipose tissue system uh, than people. It's not quite really so translatable. You have a different liver system as well. Things are not quite the same as they are in people. And so we measured, we looked at, Anya Fuchs did these studies, looked at macrophages and ad abdominal fat adipose tissue. And you can see that there is this progressive increase in the angry macrophages, M1-like macrophages, from healthy lean to healthy obese, unhealthy obese, and a decrease in the good macrophages that are anti-inflammatory uh, shown here. But there's incredible overlap. Look at the individual subjects. The means are different, but there's a lot of overlap. A lot of obese healthy that have the same macrophage content as the unhealthy obese shown here. But then there's also an increased expression of pro-inflammatory genes. So I will, these, these are just a handful of them showing you that they're progressively increased from healthy lean to healthy obese, but with considerable overlap between the two. But the one that sticks out the most is serpene-1, which encodes PI-1, plasma, plasminogen activator inhibitor-1, is the one that sticks out the most in our hands all the time, with unhealthy obese is higher than healthy obese, higher than lean. So then, so what? How does this translate? into systemic insulin sensitivity or not. Well, if you measure these different cytokines and adipokines in plasma, TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, IL-6, I won't, won't go through them, in unhealthy obese in orange, healthy obese in green, and healthy lean in blue, you see that there's no difference between unhealthy and healthy obese, that they track together for the most part. In fact, sometimes the unhealthy obese are lower than the healthy obese, as shown here for IL-1 beta, um, and as shown here again for interferon gamma. But you cannot make an argument that there's an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and that we've measured about 10 others that I'm not going to show you here. And in fact, these cytokine concentrations are quite low. This is picograms per ml, two to three picograms per ml, very low concentrations, potentially below the pharmacological effect of those cytokines as well except for pi-1. Look at the difference in concentration. You get this diurnal variability, and pi-1 is much higher in the unhealthy obese than the healthy obese, than the lean shown here. And if you look at the relationship between 24-hour plasma pi-1 concentrations and insulin sensitivity, again, glucose rate of disposal divided by insulin concentration during the clamp procedure, you see this nice curvilinear relationship that pi-1 correlates very nicely with insulin sensitivity. So pi-1 could be a mechanism. And now the last insulin sensitivity mechanism I'm going to show you here are small extracellular vesicles, exosomes. So these are things that are produced by every cell in the body. They're made from multivesicular bodies in a cell. So these are, these are um, spheres inside a cell that pack with them microRNA, proteins, and lipids. And they then bind to the plasma membrane and get released from the cell, what's called a small extracellular vesicle, or an exosome, and tr gets transported to other organs in the body, or even to the same organ, a cell next door, but usually other organs in the body, and regulate metabolic function we know now in those organs. It's an important signaling system from one organ to another. And adipose tissue potentially makes the most exosomes circulating in blood than any other organ uh, in the body, at least in rodent models, that seems to be the case. And so we looked at plasma exosomes in our subjects. They're much higher in the unhealthy obese than the healthy obese shown here in concentrations, as you can see, than lean. And if you incubate myotubes uh, with these exosomes from the unhealthy obese and healthy obese here with insulin, 
you can see here that the healthy obese do, do not affect insulin signaling compared to the healthy lean people, AKT phosphorylation, serine phosphorylation shown here. But the unhealthy obese reduce insulin signaling from plasma exosomes as well as adipose tissue exosomes as shown here. So exosomes are a potential mediator of insulin regulation, insulin sensitivity in people who are obese, which has been shown very well to be the case in rodent models. Jerry Olesky has shown that, ad, uh, that exosomes made from adipose tissue macrophages go into the bloodstream. And you can take a mouse who's obese, take their exosomes, infuse them into a mouse that's lean from their adipose tissue exosomes, and make them insulin resistant. You can take exosomes from adipose tissue macrophages of a lean mouse, infuse that into an obese mouse, and make that insulin sensitive. Any questions about exosomes? OK. I'm just going to summarize obesity here very quickly and show you that if you look at gene expression, you get this pattern of extracellular matrix uh, genes are down or upregulated sorry, in the metabolic and healthy obese compared to healthy obese compared to lean. Inflammation is also downregulated. And lipogenesis, I'm not going to get into that right now. Is, uh, is, I'm sorry, upregulated. Inflammation and extra matrix protein are upregulated. Lipogenesis is downregulated in unhealthy obese people. Um, just because you see these abnormalities in adipose tissue doesn't mean it's a cause. You've got to look at the mechanism signaling, and that's potentially endotrophin in adipose tissue for extra matrix and potentially PI-1 exosomes, and we also know adiponectin, leptin, is potentially involved in this as well. Now, I'm going to skip the muscle, and I'm going to go to the pancreas. And then, you know what? It's already noon. But what, when do we have till? We, we have till 12.30. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, but we need questions. Oh, we, okay, so, okay, so any questions so far before I go to the beta cell? Malcolm, no question from you? No, yeah, OK. He, yeah, he's been on his cell phone the whole time that we've been talking. <laughs> he's been texting away. It's uh, unbelievable. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to skip muscle, because I, we'll have this a, a fat-focused uh, um, presentation. And we're going to now move on to measuring beta cell function. So as you know, beta cell is part of the islets in the pancreas. And beta cells make insulin. And insulin is a very important hormone for, every, for all kinds of things. Now, measuring beta cell function is not clear cut. There's no standardized measurement of beta cell function. And most of the measures of beta cell function actually don't even measure beta cell function that are reported in the literature. And so looking at the literature of beta cell function, you have to really look at the methods they use for measuring it, not just the conclusions. And there's, I won't go through the different methods that have been used to measure it. We think the best approach to measuring beta cell function is the insulin secretory response to a glucose challenge. And to do it through an oral glucose challenge, not an intravenous glucose challenge, because that brings into account all the incretins that are involved in stimulating uh, insulin secretion as well. And so the way we do this is we do an oral glucose tolerance test in people. That's when you drink 75 grams of glucose, no matter how big you are, if you weigh 1,000 kilograms, or 50 kilograms, you get the same 75 gram glucose test. And the, the criteria for being healthy or not are the same in both groups. Quite crazy, but that's the way life is uh, in medicine. But we do a glucose tolerance test, measure the insulin secretion rate in the first 30 minutes of that glucose tolerance test, because that's when you have the greatest challenge to the beta cell, where the glucose is rising very, very rapidly to a peak in that first 30 minutes. And look at that in relationship to the circulating glucose concentration. So this is not a time test of insulin secretion rate over time in relation to glucose challenge, but really the insulin secretion rate over 30 minutes with multiple sampling, so you can get a curve, not just a straight line of two samples. You can get a curve in relationship to the glucose concentration during that glucose tolerance test. And what you have here are people lean in diamonds. People are obese with normal fasting glucose and normal glucose tolerance. People obese with normal fasting glucose but impaired glucose tolerance, meaning at two hours after glucose load, they have high glucose concentrations. And people with impaired fasting glucose, a fasting glucose more than 100, 
and impaired glucose tolerance as well. And then people that are way off the chart, obese with type 2 diabetes. So they have serious dysfunction in beta cell function, uh, although insulin sensitivity might be the same as these other obese people shown here. And what you see is something very interesting, is that if you're obese with normal fasting glucose, whether you have normal glucose tolerance or impaired glucose tolerance, you have an increased insulin secretion rate in response to a glucose challenge greater than a lean person that's shown here. So people who are obese have increased beta cell function, not decreased, enhanced beta cell function. They have an increased secretion of insulin in relationship to a glucose challenge using this kind of technique. People who are obese with impaired fasting glucose then slip down the curve, and they have the same insulin uh, uh, beta cell function or response as a lean person. And people with diabetes, as I mentioned, is off the charts. They have a very poor insulin secretory response in relationship to glucose load. Now, this insulin secretion rate, not insulin concentration, and those two are very different because insulin concentration represents the balance between secretion and removal. And unless you look at that balance, you can't really determine the beta cell component of insulin concentration versus the removal component of insulin concentration. Any questions on this? Now, the reason why these obese people have increased, or people with obesity, sorry, I'm politically incorrect. Don't report me, Sue. <laughs> you you got to do, I forget what it is, something person first. People with obesity, and now I'm going to be attacked for, for, for making fun of <laughs> the political correctness. I'm in big trouble here already. But at least, at least you'll get your clinical research unit uh, out of it. <clears throat> so people with obesity have twice as many beta cells in autopsy studies than people who are lean. People with diabetes have half as many. And so not only do they have more beta cells, but also the function of individual beta cells may be enhanced as well in terms of potassium ATP channels. We won't go in through the whole insulin you know, stimulations cascade. Yeah. Yes, they're putting out more insulin. The secretion of insulin is higher. They have higher fasting insulin concentrations and higher insulin concentrations in response to a glucose challenge until they start going off the edge. Now, these are cross-sectional studies where we can make pretend it's longitudinal until their beta cells start to fail, and then they get impaired fasting glucose, and then they develop type 2 diabetes. Because insulin sensitivity measured with a clamp is no different in these impaired fasting glucose people compared to these diabetes people. It's a beta cell that causes the difference between these two. OK, I'm going to spend five minutes on now weight loss and the response to weight loss. So as I showed you, there's considerable heterogeneity in obesity and the metabolic response to excess body fat. There's also considerable heterogeneity in the response to weight loss. One is one therapy gives you markedly different weight loss in different people who are obese, from no weight loss to even weight gain, even with GLP-1 agonists, although very rare, and then a lot of weight loss in some people. But we always look at the average and forget the spread of weight loss across people. And even at the same weight loss, you can get a different metabolic response to that amount of weight loss. Some people improve some things remarkably. Other people don't change at all. So by accident, we looked at our data in people that had a, a large amount of weight loss, 18% weight loss, either by bariatric surgery or by intensive diet therapy. And we found when we did that, when we look at those people, they have the normal kind of response on average. They improve their insulin sensitivity with a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp procedure by 50 to 100%, you know, and about 75% on average. But if you look at the individuals, this is now the change in insulin stimulated glucose disposal. This is, the re this is the clamp procedure stimulating glucose uptake. You see that the average is around 75 or 100, but the range is extraordinary, where some people actually got worse with marked weight loss, and some people got a lot better. But the average is the same, and we never really looked at that until we decided to look at it and write this paper. And so we call these people responders who are the people that had at least a, I think, 75% or greater increase in insulin sensitivity. So by design, their insulin sensitivity markedly increased with this weight loss. And then the non-responders, which are these people down here, 
Oh, yeah, I'm, they're marked in black. Sorry, non-responders that are down here, which actually even got a little worse, although that's probably within the range of experimental error, but statistically worse because we chose them you know, from, the, from this group here. So some people don't do better at all with weight loss metabolically in terms of insulin sensitivity, and they didn't change their triglycerides or other things as well, but some people did. And what it turns out is, depending on how insulin sensitive you are, are, insulin sensitive you are to begin with, determines how you respond to weight loss. So if you're very insulin sensitive, which is up here, you have a very minimal, I'm sorry, if you're very insulin resistant, which is here, your baseline insulin stimulated glucose rate of disposal is very poor up here, you have a very marked response to weight loss in terms of percent improvement. If you're very insulin sensitive, shown here, you have a very poor response. So if you're not broken, you cannot fix it uh, with weight loss. And this has some clinical implications regarding the aggressiveness of therapy in people. So treating these obese people, you're not treating them to improve their insulin sensitivity. You're treating them to improve their joints, their ability to get around, their quality of life. But you're not going to have a beneficial effects on their metabolic health because they're already metabolically healthy. The next thing I wanted to mention is that we know that a little bit of weight loss, I'm not showing the data because of time, Losing 5% of your body weight if you're metabolic unhealthy has a marked improvement on metabolic health. So you don't have to lose, get be, become lean to become a healthy or obese person. Losing a little bit of weight can make you healthy. And so we, because of that, we just thought, well, then, you know, it's so hard to do these medieval therapies of eat less, you know, try to be physically more active. That's so passe. What you can now remove, you can suck the fat out of people with liposuction which is the most common cosmetic surgical procedure uh, in the country. And with large volume liposuction, which is what it's called, you can remove large volumes of adipose tissue. So we went with our plastic surgeons, and we took women who are obese with normal glucose tolerance. These are relatively healthy uh, uh, women. And we took women who are obese with type 2 diabetes. And, we had our, and they had abdominal fat distribution, as shown here. And we had our plastic surgeon removed 10 kilograms of body fat, which was equal to about a 12% weight loss had they lost that weight by dieting, which should have caused marked improvements in their metabolic function, metabolic health. And they went from looking like this to looking like this. So a marked improvement in moving this big paniculus of abdominal fat from these women. But what you see is their waist circumference improved, obviously, which is a risk factor, <clears throat> but nothing else did. Look, <coughs> blood pressure, glucose, insulin, triglycerides, um, cholesterol levels, nothing changed with weight loss. And if you measure <coughs> insulin sensitivity using the clamp procedure, I get very emotional over this study. Um, <coughs> you see that in purple after the 10 kilogram weight loss compared to yellow before, that the glucose production rate during a two-stage clamp with a low-dose insulin infusion to suppress glucose production by the liver and a high-dose insulin infusion to stimulate glucose uptake by muscle tissue, you see absolutely no difference after compared to the before weight loss in women with or without type 2 diabetes. <coughs> These are the most reproducible clamp data that you can you know, possibly uh, see, showing that fat removal does not affect metabolic health. It's how you remove the fat that's important. And this raises some serious questions about at the link between adipose tissue and metabolic health. When you lose fat by liposuction, you remove billions of fat cells, but you do nothing to the size or anything to the remaining fat cells or the fat that's in your liver or other tissues. When you remove fat by eating less calories, you shrink the size of all your fat cells. You remove fat in these other organs as well. Is that the mechanism? Or is it the flux of energy? Because when you remove fat by liposuction, you're still eating the same diet, because that doesn't affect your metabolic rate very much. But when you remove fat by eating less, you become a smaller person, you, your energy flux is much lower. Yes, Dr. Butner. Yes. We, we have done that as well with Nadia Bumrad and Vanderbilt. We, he did omentectomies. Uh, in people with type 2 diabetes, laparoscopically. Amazing he got that approved. And the omentum hangs down like a, 
uh, it's an apron of fat from the transverse colon inside your intestine. And that represents, in general, about a third of your intra-abdominal body fat. Your intra-abdominal or visceral body fat consists of the omentum and also the mesenteric fat that's lining the intestine. And by removing that, you have absolutely no effect on insulin sensitivity. Now, could it be mesenteric fat is the thing? And I doubt it as well. In fact, there's no mechanism that you can explain why this little bit of fat inside your abdomen could cause systemic you know, harm. You know, what, what's the signal uh, there as well? Yes? <clears throat> Oh, after liposuction? It's a very good question. All, now, this is plastic. Any plastic surgeons here? OK. This is plastic surgery data, which is very poor. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's anecdotal. And when you remove fat by liposuction, you destroy the architecture, the framework that keeps those fat cells there. And so if you gain weight after liposuction, you don't gain it back, usually, in a place where you removed it. It goes to other places. So women who have had liposuction, where they regain weight, they get humps on their back, they get larger breasts, and increase fat under their arms in general. They don't increase it in the area where they had the fat removal because of the destruction of the architecture. We studied these people actually four years later. And, uh, with, and we, the people who did not change their body weight for four years, and there was no difference. They, they maintained, they did not improve their metabolic health four years later compared to, um, you know, this is now 10 weeks after liposuction where we made sure they didn't change their body weight except for the fat that they lost. Now, there's a lot of plastic surgery literature showing that liposuction improves metabolic health. But those, if you look carefully, those are people who became religious about their lifestyle, and they lost more weight after the liposuction because they felt good about themselves, I guess, you know, could be more physically active, uh, et cetera. I really was in my pajamas? <laughs> I, 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 I can't believe I would do that. I can't. <clears throat> Yeah, speak into the box, yeah. <laughs> it's thing. Can't you okay. guys just get a regular? Uh, <laughs> I know. I, don't, I never, this is new for us, too. Um, so we've done studies where we, we made, um, we fed a high-fat diet, and the, and the mice were the same weight, you know, as they were weight matched. And there were really bad things that happened with the high-fat diet and not other. Can you just compare it to this liposuction model where what they're doing, their, their pancreas, their liver, their diet, and, and how that's influencing the fact that their metabolic health is not improving. Yeah, so, so, di so diet, there's two components to a diet, uh, as you all know. One is the energy content, which regulates energy, you know, body mass. And one is the composition, which can be a healthy or unhealthy, you know, composition. So a high fat diet in rodents is really a high fat, high carbohydrate, it's a high calorie, high fat, high <coughs> sugar, you know, diet as well. It has a lot of things, not, it's not, not a key, it's not a ketogenic diet. So it's not a high fat diet like Atkins, which causes you to lose weight for unknown reasons as well, although it might just be because if you cut out the sugars and carbohydrates, you're eating less calories and you don't replace that by eating more fat. Like for example, if you have a steak for dinner and are full and someone offers you a high fat, high protein steak for dessert, you'll say no thank you. But if they offer you ice cream, you'll eat that ice cream despite being in, in agony you know, uh, because you're stuffed already because of the wanting and liking, you know, of food. So, I, so the composition of the diet is very important. The Mediterranean diet, for example, um, uh, causes an improvement in cardiometabolic health, reduction of risk of heart disease, risk of diabetes, despite really no changes in body weight by ha in these randomized trials in Spain of people eating a Mediterranean diet versus their regular diet. And so diet composition is very important for health, and we ignore that a lot. And that's why I want you to speak about plant-based diets and bone health in our conference next year. So now I'm going to just finish up really quickly <coughs> with um, just show, you know, how much weight loss is enough. So if you have someone who's metabolically healthy, how much weight loss should you lead? Well, any amount of weight loss, if you're metabolic and healthy, is good. But it, can you top it off? Is there a point where it doesn't really help anymore? And the data suggests, I'll just say, that when you lose 15 to 25 percent of your body weight, you may be at the max benefit of what weight loss would do for you. But based on data 
in primary care practices of people with type 2 diabetes, and also surgery studies showing how much weight it took to get into remission, meaning having no diabetes medications and having a hemoglobin A1C, a measurement of glucose control, crudely at below some lower kind of threshold. And so 15 to 20 percent, 20, 15 to 25 percent of your body weight is somewhere now, it should be maybe the max target for most people who are obese in terms of